students i hope that you're all doing fine just like i had mentioned in the previous lecture this being the seventh lecture of this certification course i'll be continuing with the query concept of free consent itself and completing it in this lecture so let's begin now as you can see on your screen right now we are going to start with misrepresentation in the last lecture we had holistically covered coercion and undue influence as to the requirements of the pcsj examination and now in this lecture we are going to deal with misrepresentation followed by fraud followed by rescission so under misrepresentation as you can see a contract the consent to which is induced by misrepresentation is voidable at the option of the deceived party misrepresentation means misstatement of a fact material to the contract misrepresentation is defined in section 18 whereby section 18 says that misrepresentation means and includes number 1 the positive assertion in a manner not warranted by the information of the person making it of that which is not true though he believes it to be true number 2 any breach of duty which without an intent to deceive gains an advantage to the person committing it or anyone claiming under him by misleading another to his prejudice or to the prejudice of any one claiming under him number 3 causing however innocently a party to an agreement to make a mistake as to the substance of the thing which is the subject which is the subject of the agreement so we see over here that misrepresentation is defined in under section 18 in three ways and we are going to discuss each of these ways but first I want to draw your attention towards this question which was asked in the recent examination of 2016 of UP PCSJ and the question said A introduces B to C as his partner and B remains silent in fact A and B are not partners C supplies goods to B on credit is A liable for B's act so in this problem students A introduces B to C as his partners and B remains silent. So in fact we see that A and B are not partners and C supplied goods to B on credit then A is liable for B's act. The moment C supplied goods to B on credit A is liable for B's act. And the reason for this is as follows. Number 1 A made a misrepresentation to C and number 2 believing that misrepresentation C supplied goods to B on credit that is he changed his status and that is why A is bound by his misrepresentation by doctrine of estoppel and he cannot turn round his own statement therefore he is stopped by the doctrine of estoppel and will become liable for B's act so this was the solution for this given problem it would have hardly taken 2 to 3 minutes to answer it now uh we're going to begin with the the very lecture that is the misrepresentation that uh, we were discussing earlier so like i said this section includes the following types of misrepresentation number 1 unwarranted statements so when a person positively asserts that a fact is true when he, if in his information does not warrant it to be so though he believes it to be true this is misrepresentation so we see that in the case of ocean extreme navigation company versus sundar das dharam se the fact was is that the defendants chartered a ship from the plaintiffs who stated that the ship was certainly not more than 2800 tonnage register as a matter of fact the ship had never been in bombay and was wholly unknown to the plaintiffs she turned around she turned out to be of the registered tonnage of more than 3000 tons here it was held that the defendants were entitled to avoid the charter party because as the court held there was the positive assertion by the plaintiffs about the size of the ship an assertion not warranted by any information the plaintiff had at the time and which was not true further a statement is said to be warranted by the information of the person making it when he receives the information from a trustworthy source so it should not be a mere hearsay thus as seen in mohanlal versus sri gunja ji cotton mills company where by the facts were such that b told the plaintiff that one c would be the director of a company and b had obtained this information not from c direct but from another person called l the information proved untrue so the judge said i am not inclined to think that if b relied on second hand information he derived from l 
he was warranted in making the positive assertion that C would be a director. So where a, mis where a representation acquires the status of being a term of the contract and it turns out to be untrue, then the disadvantaged party may not only avoid the contract but also sue for damages for breach. Thus, in Richview Construction Co. v. Raspa, where in the course of negotiation for the sale of lamb, the seller stated that the whole of the lot was fully serviced, whereas this was not so. The buyer was then allowed damages for the breach of this warranty. Now that we have covered the first part, we are going to the second bit of this uh, part, uh, the very the second bit of the section of misrepresentation, that is breach of duty. So any breach of duty which brings an advantage to the person committing it by misleading the other to his prejudice is a misrepresentation. As simple as that. As observed in Oriental Bank Corporation v. John Fleming, this clause is probably intended to meet all those cases which are called in the court of equity, cases of constructive fraud in which there is no intention to deceive but where the circumstances are such as to make the party who derives a benefit from the transaction equally answerable in effect as if he had been actuated by motives of fraud or deceit. In this case, the plaintiff, having no time to read the contents of a deed, signed it as he was given the impression by the defendant that it contained nothing but formal matters already settled between them. The deed, however, contained a release in favour of the defendant. Accordingly, the plaintiff was allowed to set aside the deed. The defendant, the court said, was under no obligation legally or morally to communicate the contents of the deed. But the plaintiff placed confidence. It then became his duty to state fully without concealment all that was essential to a knowledge of the contents of a document. Further, in Ayer vs. Meets there, we notice that there is a female patient who was told that her sterilization would be irreversible but was not told that there was the minute risk that, that is less than 1% of failure and of pregnancy. She conceived again, delivered a child and sued the gynecologist for his breach of contract. So here the representation that the operation was irreversible, irreversible was held as not amounting to an express guarantee that the operation was bound to achieve its acknowledged object of sterilizing the plaintiff. Here it's a very important situation, please understand. The representation meant no more than this that the operative procedure in question was incapable of being reversed. The court would be slow to imply a term that the expected result would, would actually be achieved. This covers the idea of breach of duty. I have mentioned enough case laws to cover this aspect and uh, students uh, you need not go to different places to uh, mug up different case laws because what really matters is that under every important subtopic you must have at least two to three cases which are important if you're going for more than three cases and then then naturally you're going to suffer with the quality of the entire syllabus because the syllabus is so wide that naturally if you're going to have three cases prepared and continuously revised for one subtopic then it become then it's going to become really bulky for you to carry it all along. Now, moving on, the third sub aspect of this definition of misrepresentation as mentioned in this section. So the third important aspect of this definition of misrepresentation in this section is inducing mistake about subject matter. So as mentioned in section 18.3 causing however innocently a party to an agreement to make a mistake as to the substance of the thing which is the subject of the agreement is also misrepresentation. That is, the subject matter of every agreement is supposed by the parties to possess certain value or quality. If one of the parties leads the other however innocently to make a mistake as to the nature or quality of the subject matter, there is misrepresentation. Thus, in Nursey SPG versus in thus in Nursey SPG and WVG Co Limited, whereby the facts were such that the directors of a company, while acting within their authority, sold on the company's behalf a bill of exchange to a bank, and the company denied liability on the bill, but the bank was held entitled. Thus, in the case of Nursey SPG and WVG Co Limited, 
whereby the fact was says that the directors of a company while acting within their authority had sold on the company's behalf a bill of exchange to a bank and in this case the company had then denied liability on the bill it was held that the bank was actually entitled to recover the amount of the bill from the company as money received to the use of the bank the court held the bill was different from what it was expressly represented to be by the agents of the company so now talking about the suppression of vital facts this being another component we must understand that misrepresentation may also arise from supp- suppression of vital facts in that cases of concealment or suppression will fall either under subsection 2 when it amounts to a breach of duty or under subsection 3 when it leads the other party to make a mistake about the subject matter of the agreement thus in k versus kelsen the prospectus of a company stated that the company had regularly paid dividends which created the impression that the company was making profits whereas the truth was that the company had been running into losses for the last several years and dividends could only be paid out of war time accumulated profits here the suppression of this fact was held to be a misrepresentation now having discussed suppression of vital facts we're going to talk about suppression of material facts thus misrepresentation should be of facts material to the contract mere commendatory expressions such as men of business will habitually make about their goods are not sufficient to avoid the contract so the, an example of this is seen in is seen in demick versus hallett where in a sale of land a mere general statement that the land is fertile and improvable whereas parts of it had been abandoned abandoned as useless cannot except in extreme cases as for instance where a considerable part is covered with water or otherwise irreclaimable be considered such a misrepresentation as to entitle the purchaser to be discharged thus it again it's a complex sentence if you uh, cut out the uh, the specific the specificity then you can read it as that a mere general statement that the land is fertile and improvable but in smith versus land and house property corporation when in the sale of a hotel the tenant was described as a most desirable tenant whereas his rent was in arrears now this was held to be a material misrepresentation now coming to the idea of expression of opinion which is something very basic that a mere expression of opinion cannot be regarded as a misrepresentation of facts even if the opinion turns out to be wrong but again in some cases a statement of opinion may also amount to misrepresentation now what are these cases so one such situation was stated by bolen lord uh, learned judge bolen in the case of smith versus land and house property corporation the very one which we just discussed and he said it is often fallaciously assumed that a statement of opinion cannot involve a statement of fact but in a case where the facts are equally well known to both parties what one of them says to the other is frequently nothing but an expression of opinion but if the facts are not equally well known to both sides then a statement of opinion by one who knows the facts best involves very often a statement of a material fact for he impliedly states that he knows facts which justify his opinion so this can be a constructive criticism of this particular topic the very statement of learned jet bol boen now in the case of hotel the your hotel the el europe limited versus correct freer where a claim was made through an advertisement that the defendants were the top flight cabaret performers performers in europe the court said that it was a statement of opinion the hotel which engaged them on the basis of the claim could not terminate the contract on the ground of misrepresentation now coming to the idea of the representation of state of mind so a representation of one state of mind is also a representation of fact as seen in edginton versus fitzmorris whereby the prospectus of a company misstated the purpose to which the money to be borrowed by issuing the ventures was going to be applied here the directors intended that the representation related to the state of their mind as to what use the money was going to be put and they could change their mind and therefore it was not a misrepresentation of a specific fact the court of appeal however pointed out that the state of a man's mind is as much a fact as the state of his digestion 
and what the court meant with this statement was that a misrepresentation as to the state of a man's mind is therefore a misstatement of fact. Further, it has been held in Bannerman v. White that the intention of the parties is very important in the matter of contracting because the intention of the parties governs in the making and in the construction of all contracts. And so, if the party is so intent, the sale may be absolute with a warranty super added or that the sale may be conditional to be null and void if the warranty is broken. Now, coming to the idea of change of circumstances. So, there are many cases where the circumstances they change in the very uh, process of the contract. So, in SO Petroleum Co Limited versus Mardum, whereby a petroleum company acquired a site on a main road for constructing a petrol pump estimating its annual consumption to be 2, two lakh gallons from the third year of operation. The planning authority however permitted the pump to be erected only at the back side of the site, site which was accessible only from the side streets and not at all from not, and not at all visible from the busy main road and this considerably affected the sale potential. So, it was seen over here that even so they failed to point this out to the lessee of the pump who in consequence invested money on the basis of the originally intimidated estimates and suffered losses. They were held liable for the plaintiff's loss. The court laid down that where during the course of pre-contractual negotiations, one party who had special knowledge and expertise concerning the subject matter of the negotiations made a forecast with the intention of inducing the other party to enter into a contract and the other party did so, the court then can construe that the forecast was not merely an expression of opinion but as constituting a warranty and accordingly they were held liable for the breach of the warranty. So every person who offers an advice, information or opinion of this kind is under a duty of reasonable care to see that it is true and that this duty was not limited to persons carrying on the profession or business of giving advice. Now, dealing with the idea of inducement, we must cite the case law of Hems Enterprises versus Ishak bin Sugri for in this case it has been held that it is further necessary that misrepresentation must be the cause of the consent in the sense that but for the misrepresentation the consent would not have been given. So the explanation to section 19 provides that a fraud or misrepresentation which did not cause the consent to a contract of the party of whom such fraud was practiced or to whom such misrepresentation was made does not render a contract voidable. Further, it has been held in Chuan B Reality PTE Limited versus T G Yo that there would be no misrepresentation even if the advertisement was false. If the buyer had inspected the good before buying them unless he was the victim of some concealed defect which could not be known by external examination. But they can be a means of discovering the truth. So we notice that too that a party cannot complain of misrepresentation if he had the means of discovering the truth with ordinary diligence. You must have, you must be recalling this idea because it is recognized by way of an exception stated along with section 19. The statement is as follows. If such consent was caused by misrepresentation or by silence, fraudulent within the meaning of section 17, the contract nevertheless is not voidable if the party whose con consent was so caused had the means of discovering the truth with ordinary diligence. So in Shoshi Mohan Pal Chaudhary versus Nobu Kristo Podar, whereby a person who bought a quantity of rice was precluded from a misrepresentation about its quality because he lived very near the place where the goods were lying and therefore might have discovered the truth with ordinary diligence. But where the truth cannot be discovered with ordinary diligence, the party guilty of misrepresentation cannot rely on this defense. Thus, as seen in Nursi SPG and WVG Co Limited, where again the facts were the same, just like I discussed. The facts of this case were such that the director of a company falsely told the bank that the bill they were selling to the bank was one on which the company was liable. So it was held that no ordinary diligence would have enabled the bank to discover that the company was not liable on the bill. So that covers this idea but a difficult question about this exception is that where a person has the means of discovering the truth 
but does not use them and contracts in reliance upon the statements made to him whether the contract then would be voidable so in such cases the principle seems to be that if he relies upon those means he cannot afterwards complain of the misrepresentation so it is very important that you understand and memorize this given concept first understand it and then memorize it but continuing if he does not use the means and relies upon the statements made to him he can avoid now this idea is as important so this given idea this given principle it was laid down by the court of appeal in the case of red grave versus earth now students as we have successfully discussed misrepresentation as to the requirements of pcs examination we are going to shift our attention towards fraud which again is a very important topic in the under the ambit of free consent so what is fraud fraud is nothing but an intentional misrepresentation of facts as defined in section 17 Fraud means and includes any of the following acts committed by a party to a contract or with his connivance or by his agent with the intent to deceive another party thereto or his agent or to induce him to enter into the contract. Number 1 the suggestion as a fact of that which is not true by one who does not believe it to be true. Number 2 the active concealment of a fact by one having knowledge or belief of the fact. Number 3 a promise made without any intention of performing it number 4 any other act fitted to deceive and number 5 any such act or omission as the law specially declares to be fraudulent now there is an explanation here that mere silence as to the facts likely to affect the willingness of a person to enter into a contract is not fraud unless the circumstances of the case are such that regard being had to them it is the duty of the person keeping silence to speak or unless his silence is in itself equivalent to speech now there are a lot of illustrations attached over here a a sells by auction to be a horse which a knows to be unsound a says nothing to be about the horse's unsoundness this is not fraud in a b b is a's daughter and has just come of age here the relation between the parties would make it a's duty to tell b if the horse is unsound c b says b says to a if you do not deny it i shall assume that the horse is sound a says nothing here a silence is equivalent to speech and d a and b being traders enter upon a contract A has private information of a change in prices which would affect B's willingness to proceed with the contract. A is not bound to inform B. So, starting with the explanation of different provisions, we would start with the assertion of facts where belief in truth does not exist. So, in English law, fraud was defined in the well-known decision of the House of Lords in Derry v. P, which is a case law of 1889. So here Lord Herschel said that fraud is proved when it is shown that a false representation has been made. Number 1 either knowingly or number 2 without belief in its truth or number 3 recklessly careless whether it be true or false. So in the in this particular case a company's prospectus contained a representation that the company had been authorized by a special act of parliament to run trams by steam or mechanical power. The authority to use steam was in fact subject to the approval of the board of trade but no mention was made of this the board refused consent and consequently the company was wound up the plaintiff having bought some shares sued the directors for fraud but here obviously they were not held liable and the reason why they were not guilty of law of fraud was because they honestly believed that once the parliament had authorized the use of steam the consent of the board was practically concluded so it follows therefore that the person making a false representation is not guilty of fraud if he honestly believes in a, in its truth this intentional misrepresentation is of the essence of fraud the first three clauses of section 17 deal with this kind of fraud now active concealment as held in gauri shankar versus joshi amba shankar family trust active concealment is something different from mere passive concealment because passive concealment means mere silence as to material facts however an active concealment of a material fact is a fraud mere silence excepting the few cases noted below does not amount to fraud 
So the expression any other act fitted to deceive naturally means any act which is done with the obvious intention of committing fraud. And in the case of Ningava versus Bhairappa Shidappa Hirekurabar, where a husband where a husband persuaded his illiterate wife to sign certain documents, telling her that by them he was going to mortgage her to two lands to secure his indebtedness and in fact mortgage four lands belonging to her. This was an act done with the intention of deceiving her. Now coming to the idea where mere silence is no fraud. So it has been held in Aaron's Reeves versus Twist that false impression is ordinarily conveyed by, deliber- de- by deliberate misstatement of facts. But it may also be done by an active concealment of material facts. I do not care, said Lord Halsbury, Hul- by what means a false impression is conveyed, by what trick or device or ambiguous language, all those are expedients by which fraudulent people seem to think that they can escape from the real substance of the transaction. So, further in Sri Krishnan versus Kurukshetra University, where by a candidate who had full knowledge of the fact that he was short of attendance and he did not mention this fact in his examination form, this was held to be no fraud, it being the duty of the university to scrutinize forms and to call for verification or information in case of doubts. The university having failed to do so, was stopped from cancelling the examination of the candidate. Now we are going to discuss cases when silence has been considered to be fraud. So at the very offset we must discuss the first principle whereby duty to speak or contract uberima fights is discussed. So the first such case is when the person keeping silence is under duty to speak. Duty to speak arises when one contracting party reposes trust and confidence in the other. A father, for example, selling a horse to his son must tell him if the horse is unsound as the son is likely to rely upon his father. But the principle is not so confined. The duty to disclose the truth will arise in all cases where one party reposes and the other accepts confidence. So the duty to speak also arises where one of the parties is utterly without any means of discovering the truth and has to depend on the good sense of the other party. For example, in T.J. Chako vs. LIC, where false news, where false answers as to the state of health were given in a proposal for life insurance, the policy was held to be voidable. And it was not material that the medical officer of the corporation has certified the life assured as good. So, and here I am going to discuss a question from uh, UPPCSA 2006, which was a prelims question. The question said, B says to A, if you do not deny it, I will assume that the horse is sound. A says nothing. Here A silence is equivalent to speech. The illustration is based on, as you must have recalled that, you know, I just discussed with you the same given section. It, it comes from section 70. So, it has been held in the case of LIC versus B. Kusuma T. Rai, that burden of proof lies on the insurer to show that the fact misstated or suppressed was of material nature to the risk covered and that the same was done to cause misconception about the risk undertaken by the insurer. Now, in the case of any absence of any such relationship, there is no duty to speak and mere silence, even if it amounts to misrepresentation, will be no fraud. Thus, in Haji Ahmad Yar Khan vs. Abdul Ghani Khan, whereby the plaintiff spent a sum of money to mark the engagement of his son, he then discovered the girl suffered from epileptic fits and so broke up the engagement. He sued the other party to recover from them compensation for the loss which he had suffered on account of the deliberate suppression of a vital fact which amounted to fraud. Here, the court relied upon the decision of the House of Lords in Nocton versus Lord Ashburton, which is another important case to us. So, in this case, which the court, the House of Lords relied on, that is Nocton versus Lord Ashburton, it was pointed out that a mere passive non-disclosure of the truth, however de- deceptive in fact, does not amount to fraud unless there is a duty to speak. So referring to the facts, the court said that the law imposes no general duty on anyone to broadcast the blemishes of his female relations, not even to those who are contemplating matrimony with them. 
There was no fiduciary relation between the parties. The engagement was, however, held to be voidable by reason of the misrepresentation. But the plaintiff was not entitled to recover any compensation under Section 75 on the, of the contract law. Now, this is very important case. Too. So, coming to the second area. So, where silence is deceptive. Silence is sometimes equ is itself equivalent to speech. A person who keeps silent, knowing that his silence is going to be deceptive, is no less guilty of fraud. As mentioned in illustration D of section 17, where for example the buyer knows more about the value of the property, which is the subject of sale, but prefers to keep the information from the seller, the latter may avoid the sale. Now, the change of circumstances. So, sometimes a representation is true when made, but it may on account of a change of circumstances become false when it is actually acted upon by the other party. So, in such circumstances, it is the duty of the person who made the representation to communicate the changes of circumstances. Thus, in With vs. O. Flanagan, whereby a medical practitioner represented to the plaintiff that his practice was worth £2,000 a year, but the representation was also true, but five months later when the plaintiff actually bought the practice, it had considerably, considerably gone down on account of the defendant's serious illness. So here the representation was true, but the facts had changed, the circumstances had changed. So here it was held that the change of circumstances ought to have been communicated. Now coming to another idea under this category, that is half the roots. So, even when a person is under no duty to disclose a fact, he may become guilty of fraud by non-disclosure if he voluntarily discloses something and then stops half the way. A person may keep silence, but if he speaks, a duty arises to disclose the whole truth. An ingenious construction corporation was a Cohen, whereby the plaintiff purchased a tract of land and the contract of sale stated that the land was subject to a right of the borough to open two streets within the area, but as a matter of fact, the borough had the right to open three streets as opposed to two. Here, holding that the plaintiff had the right of recession, Cordoza CJ said, we do not say that the seller was under a duty to mention the projected streets at all. That question is not here. What we say is merely this, that Having undertaken or professed to mention them, he could not fairly stop halfway. Now, there are promises made without intention of performing. So we must observe that to tie up a person to a promise with no intention of performing from one side and with the intention of only preventing the other from dealing with others is an example of promise made without the intention of performing. So there is a third type of fraud if you notice that is included in the definition in section 17. And on this note it has been held in Clo versus London that a purchase of goods without any intention of paying the price is naturally a fraud of this species. So the fourth kind of fraud identified by section 17 is any act which is fitted to deceive. So in Hunger, in Hunger Ford Investment Trust Limited versus Turner Morrison and Co Limited whereby a practitioner cast aspersions on the court and also on the opposite lawyer, the court cited generally the following statement about the concept of fraud. That fraud, as, as defined in section 17 of the Contract Act of 1872, as per, interpre as per interpretation of which two kinds of fraud are mentioned. Number one, actual or positive fraud, which includes cases of intentional and successful employment of any cunning, deception or artifice used to circumvent cheat or deceive another and number two constructive or legal fraud which includes such contracts or acts as though not originating in any actual evil design or contrivance to perpetuate a fraud yet by the tendency to deceive or mislead others or to violate private or public confidence are prohibited by law. So this was a keen observation of the court in the given case. Now any act or omissions specially declared to be fraudulent forms the fifth and the last category of frauds included in the definition of section 17, which is intended to cover all such acts which under any other branch of law are regarded as, as, regarded as fraudulent. So in insolvency for example, in the law of insolvency the concept of fraudulent preference and in the transfer of property act there is the concept of fraudulent transfer. 
So we are we have come to an end of fraud. But before we wind up with fraud, we must uh, mention the distinction that exists between fraud and misrepresentation, just like we did between coercion and undue influence. So misrepresentation and fraud have many points in common. For example, for example, both render the contact voidable. There is a false representation in both, uh, and in either case, it is necessary that the consent that the consent should have been caused by the fraud or misrepresentation. And finally, when there is a fraud by silence, the fact that there were means of discovering the truth by ordinary diligence is a good defense, and this is so in misrepresentation also. And lastly, as held in Royal Scott Trust Limited v. Robertson. The damages for loss caused by innocent misrepresentation are assessed on the same principle and as as in the case of of deliberate fraud. Yet the following points of distinction are also noticeable. Firstly, fraud is more or less an intentional wrong, whereas misrepresentation may be quite innocent. Secondly, fraud, in addition to rendering the contract voidable, is a cause of action in tort for damages. This is a very important distinction. On the other hand, simple misrepresentation is not a tort, but under Section 75 of the Contract Act, a person who rightfully rescinds a contract is entitled to compensation for any damage which he has sustained through the non-fulfilment of the contract. On that note, the English the English Misrepresentation Act of 1967 also enables the court to award damages instead of rescission. For example, in Watts v. Spence. A person who purported to sell his wife's property without obtaining her consent and she refused to sign the deed was held liable to be the was liable was held liable to the buyer for his loss. And in production technology consultants versus Butler, a purchaser of premises completed the purchase even after discovering that a tenancy agreement affecting one of the flats was concealed from him was concealed from him. And he was nevertheless allowed to sue for damages for the loss caused to him, though he had incurred the right to rescind. Now, lastly, the last difference that exists is that a person complaining of misrepresentation can be met with the defence that he had the means of discovering the truth with ordinary diligence, but accepting fraud by silence. It does not lie in the mouth of the person committing fraud to say that his victim was too easily deceived or had the means of discovering the truth. Now, lastly, I would be talking about this question which was asked in UPPCJ two thousand six, which was again a very simple question, relatively tougher but in general a very simple question. Which one of the following does not amount to fraud? So the answer, as you can see, was a representation made without knowing it to be fake, honestly believing it to be true. So it, it was a pretty easy answer because in all the other cases, uh, as you can see, suggestion as a fact, uh, su suggestion as a fact of that which is not true by one who does not believe it to be true, entire concealment of fact, a promise made without an intention of one. All this we have discussed were batim. So it is natural that the answer was. Now that we have finished. Misrepresentation and fraud. I suppose all of you must be very excited to discuss the rescission. So let's begin. Rescission of contract for undue influence is allowed under the provisions of Section 19A, which we will be dis uh, discussing first. So 19A says that power to set aside contract induced by undue influence. In that, when consent to an agreement is caused by undue influence, the agreement is a contract voidable at the option of the party whose consent was so caused. And any such contract may be set aside either absolutely or if the party who was entitled to avoid it has received any benefit thereunder upon such terms and conditions as to the court may see may seem just. And uh, there are illustrations added to this subsection. This is subsection 19a. Alas, a son has forged b's name to a promissory note. B, under threat of prosecuting a son, obtains bond from a for the amount of the forged note. If B sues on this bond, the court may set the bond aside. Illustration B: A, a money lender, A, a money lender advances rupees hundred to B, an agriculturalist, and by undue influence induces B to execute a bond for rupees two hundred with interest at six percent per month. The court may set the bond aside, ordering B to repay rupees hundred with such interest as may seem just. Now, before we start with the discussion on this 
subsection, I must discuss with you this question which was repeatedly asked first in 1997 and then in UPP Surgery 2. The question was explain equity follows the law. So to answer this question, although it looks pretty simple, but to answer this question correctly and accurately to get the good marks, it was necessary that you mentioned that Section 19A of the Contract Act 1872 gives the right to a party to rescind the contract as it is voidable at the option of the party in case his consent is obtained by undue influence. Further, Sections 64 and 65 of IC 1872 are founded on the basis of this maxim, which again was very important to mention. According to these sections, the party seeking to avoid a voidable contract is required to give back the benefit which he received from the other party to such type of contract. Now, discussing the limits of recession. So, a contract, the consent of which is caused by coercion, undue influence, fraud or misrepresentation, is voidable at the option of the party whose consent was so caused. Section 19 provides, when consent to an agreement is caused by coercion, fraud or misrepresentation, the agreement is a contract voidable at the option of the party whose consent was so caused. So the provision does not refer to undue influence because this is specifically dealt with by section 19a as, as we just discussed and section 19 further goes on to provide something special about the effect of fraud and misrepresentation. It says, a party to a contract whose consent was caused by fraud or misrepresentation may, if he thinks fit, insist that the contract shall be performed and that he shall be put in the position in which he would have been if the, if the representation made had been true. So it has been held in H.D. Hanu Manthapa vs. Mohammad Saab that uh, the party affected by the factors that make the contract voidable has to avoid it because otherwise it remains valid. It is not like that of a void agreement that does not require to be avoided. He has the option either to avoid the contract or alternatively to affirm it. When fraud is proved, the whole proceedings fails. So the suit and execution proceedings are all a nullity. And in Krishna Vanti vs LC, it was seen that the onus is on the plaintiff to prove fraud. For this purpose, he has to plead the precise particulars which constitute the alleged fraud. This onus is quite as high as the burden to prove in criminal law that the accused is guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. And he can exercise his option only once. If the contract is affirmed, it becomes enforceable by both the parties and if it is avoided, it becomes void as against both. The effect of rescission is that the contract is set aside and the parties are restored to their original position. So the right to rescind is subject to certain infirmities which defeat it in the following circumstances. So we discuss the loss of right to rescission and the first category is that of by affirmation. So we notice that where the party after becoming aware of this right to rescind, after his right to rescind, affirms a contract, the right of rescission is lost. Affirmation may be expressed or implied. An implied affirmation takes place when he does act, when he does some act inconsistent with his right to rescind. Uh, for example, where he appropriates to his uh, use the goods received under a voidable contract or has sold or attempted to sell them. And an illustrating illustration of implied affirmation can also be seen in the case of Long vs. Lloyd, where the facts versus that the defendants had induced the plaintiff to buy his lorry by falsely convincing him that it was an in, it was in excellent condition and on the very first journey the plaintiff discovered serious defect but accepted the defendant's offer to bear half the cost, cost of repairs. In this case the lorry completely broke down on the next journey and he then claimed recession. So over here after considering the fact the court held that on the first breakdown the plaintiff came to know that the representation was false and I'm sure that all of you did too as you read the facts. But Instead of asking for rescission, then he accepted the offer of repair and sent the lorry on a second trip. And this naturally amounted to a final acceptance for better or for worse and conclusively extinguished any right of rescission remaining to the plaintiff after completion of the sale. So that was the first category with which 
the right of recession could be lost. Another is that of by lapse of time. So recession must be claimed within reasonable time after discovering the misrepresentation. Thus, in question will rubber estates limited re where shares were allotted to a person on the basis of a misleading prospectus in July and in December he may have to set aside the contract, it was held that the unexplained delay of five months precluded him from obtaining the relief. At the same time, in Guwahati Municipal Corporation vs. International Construction Limited, where the challenge to an arbitration award on the ground of fraud was to be established by filing an independent suit or filing an application under Section 34 of the Arbitration and Conciliation Act of 1996, a writ petition on the ground of fraud that too after inordinate delay created a question mark about bona fides of the petitioner. The court refused to set aside the award on the ground of fraud. Another reason, another way with which the right to rescission can be lost is by that of intervention and an intervention of the rights of third parties. So the right of rescission is lost as soon as a third party acting in good faith acquires rights in the subject matter of the contract. Thus, where a person obtains goods by fraud and before the seller is able to avoid the contract, disposes them off to a bona fide party, the seller then can cannot rescind. Now, mode of rescission. It is very important that we understand this aspect because if question does come on rescission, although so far it has not, uh, at least not uh, in the mode of uh, uh, means-based question, uh, but if a question does come, we need to be sure that we understand the mode that is presented under this concept. So the usual method of rescinding a contract is by giving a notice to the other party of the intention to rescind. But what should he do if the other party cannot be contacted? The answer is to be found in Car and Universal Finance Co. Limited versus Car whereby the plaintiff gave the possession of his car to a buyer for his check. The check turned out to be worthless. The plaintiff wanted to give notice to the buyer of his intention to avoid the contract and to take back his car but could not trace him. He thereupon informed the police and the automobile association to trace his car. Sometime later, the fraudulent buyer sold the car to the defendant and the plaintiff sought to recover it. In this case, it was held that by informing the police and the association, the plaintiff had done an overt act clearly showing his, inten his intention to rescind and the sale of the car after rescission could not convey to the defendant a good title. To hold otherwise, said seller's learned judge, would involve that the defrauding party, if skillful enough to keep out of the way, would deprive the other party to the contract of his right to rescind. That another innocent party or parties may suffer does not justify imposing on a defrauded seller an impossible task. He has to establish clearly and unequivocally that he terminates the contract and is no longer to be bound by it. If he cannot communicate his decision, he may still satisfy a judge that he had made a final and irrevocable decision and ended the contract. So we come to section 66, we, where we notice that uh, the communication of the decision is to be made effective. In that it says, mode of communicating or revoking rescission of voidable contract. So the rescission of a voidable contract may be communicated or revoked in the same manner and subject to the same rules as apply to the communication or revocation of a proposal. So after completing that we realize that restitution as a concept is also important under this given topic whereby rescission is always subject to the condition that the party seeking rescission must be in a position to restore the benefits he may have obtained under the contract and section 64 requires him to do so. So consequences of rescission of affordable contract uh, as section 64 says uh, is that when a person at whose option a contract is voidable rescinds it then the other party there too need not perform any promise therein contained in which he is a promiser. So the party rescinding a voidable contract shall if he has received any benefit thereunder from another party to such contract restore such benefit, so far as may be, to the person from whom it was received. Now, on this note, in the case law of Bechu versus Babuti Prasad, 
it was held that a person avoiding a loan bond on the ground of undue influence has to pay back the loan. The court only reduces the rate of interest to what may seem to be reasonable in the circumstances. Further, it has been held in Neil v. Morley that even where the party seeking recession is not in a position to restore to the defenders his status quo ante, the court may allow recession by doing what is practically just in the circumstances. And in Hulton v. Hulton, where a wife wanted to set aside on the ground of misrepresentation the separation deed made with her husband, under which she had already received some maintenance, but she was not able to restore the money here, the court allowed her relief holding that the money may be set off against costs to which she was otherwise entitled. Swinfen E.D. Leonard had said that the general rule is that as a condition of rescission, there must be restitution in integra. But at the same time, the court has the full power to make all just allowances. Lastly, as a part of discussion, we discuss section 75 which says party rightfully rescinding contract is entitled to compensation in that a person who rightfully rescinds a contract is entitled to compensation for any damage which he has sustained throughout through the non-fulfillment of the contract. So, in ship construction versus PWD, whereby a contract for construction of a bridge was a time-bound work, the contractor failed to complete the work within the stipulated time and the state rescinded the contract. So, the contractor did not challenge it. The contract was allotted to another party and the state was held entitled to recover the loss of money thereby caused. So, that completes the recession for failure to perform within time. So students, that covers lecture 7 of the certification course under which I have discussed with you misrepresentation, fraud and recession under the ambit of free consent. We have completed the broad topic that free consent is except of course mistake which we are going to take up in the next lecture. Till then, take care and keep on revising. Thank you. Till we see each other again.